Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it, it's um, thrilling to see you, and even more thrilling to have Doris Cairns Goodwin with us. What better time? What more needy time have we ever, <laughs> ever had such a speaker? I mean, a book that actually dares to talk about leadership in a time when leadership is in such desperately short supply virtually everywhere in the world, from Saudi Arabia to the United Kingdom to the United States to Germany, France. It's, it's staring us in the face. Leadership, lack of brackets. Well, um, I'm really honored to be here today, not least because this is also um, the first special session that the RSA has had and it is designed to celebrate and mark the opening of the new coffee house, um, which is down, if you haven't been down there, it's sensational. And it's such a contrast to the rest of the building. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I'll say that again. <laughs> no, I mean, that's meant in a uh, Well, you can take it as you like. Um, but, but it, it is interesting to reflect that uh, in, in the early days of the coffee house, uh, in, in the age of enlightenment, uh, the coffee house was absolutely structural. And the, the, the desire here is actually to make it as structural as it was in those days. And given that people now long for person-to-person -person contact rather than constantly being online, it's possibly got a very good chance. Anyway, I mean, really, Doris needs no introduction. Her seven books speak for themselves. I have to confess that Lincoln Team of Rivals was the book I took on my desert island um, and uh, it, one of the most absolutely inspiring books I've ever read. I was inspired by the way the writer wrote it and inspired by the man about whom she wrote. And her book on leadership is equally inspiring and is drawn, Doris, from um, these four great presidents, wonderful Abraham Lincoln, uh, both Roosevelt's, and Lyndon Johnson. Are they the only great leaders? No, they were the ones I knew the best. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've spent nearly five decades living with them, waking up with them in the morning, thinking about them when I go to bed at night. It probably seems an odd profession to spend days and nights with dead presidents, but I, I wouldn't change it. <laughs> my, my only fear has always been that in the afterlife there'll be a panel of all these guys that I've studied, <laughs> and every single one will tell me everything I missed about them. And of course, the first person to scream will be Lyndon Johnson. How come that damn book on the Roosevelt's was twice as long as the book he wrote about me? <laughs> but I figured if I was going to venture into this new field in a certain sense, even though I'd touched on leadership in the books before, I wanted to look exclusively at leadership that I might as well start with the people that I knew the best. Mm. And LBJ isn't complicated to include in these great leaders, but what he did on civil rights and domestic, and we can talk about that, allows him to be there despite the terrible stain of the war in Vietnam. I was very young when he was president, not very young, but I was young enough. Um, and, and it seemed to me that he went through a transmogrification from a sort of typical tough Texan, mm -hmm. um, you know, su southern, uh, individual to somebody who had the enlightenment that had been around but in other quarters. Yeah, there's no question that, I mean, he had been a purpose, purposeful politician in the sense that he wanted to accumulate power most of his life, and he became the most um, extraordinary, powerful majority leader in the history of the Senate. But when he was in his 40s, he had a massive heart attack, and he then s asked himself, what if I died now, what would I be remembered for? And even though he'd been a young New Dealer and had brought rural electrification to Texas and had been progressive, he had turned conservative when he wanted to win the statewide election in Texas. But then when that heart attack came, he just decided, okay, this is it. I'm going to see what I can do. So he introduces a civil rights bill into the U.S. Senate, and then when Kennedy dies, he made civil rights his first priority. Mm -hmm. So if it hadn't been for the war, which is a crazy thing to say, if it hadn't been, he would definitely be up there. He's already coming up in presidential historians' polls, but he would be definitely up there because what he did, Medicare, Medicaid, aid to education, immigration reform, PBS, NPR, um, Head Start, um, voting rights, civil rights, fair housing. It's extraordinary, that legislation he got through in 18 months. And that was his purpose, but then he obviously got into an epic failure of leadership in the war in Vietnam. 
But therefore you're describing a man who was made a leader by an event in his life rather than born a leader. I think that's right. I mean, one of the questions that I wanted to ask, these questions that I brought to this book are the kind, when I was in graduate school, we used to sit around at night thinking about where does ambition come from? Are you born a leader? Or are you made a leader? Is it the man that makes the times or the times make? It might sound pretty nerdy, but we'd be having drinks as we were talking about all this. <laughs> and in his case, or most of the cases, Teddy Roosevelt wrote an article in which he said there's two kinds of success in the world. One is when you have a talent that somebody, no matter how hard they try, can't emulate, like a Keats writing a poem or Shakespeare writing a play. But most success, he said, are people develop qualities they already have to an extraordinary degree through hard, sustained work. And that's really true. I mean, Lincoln, I think, was born with a gift for language. Teddy had a photographic memory, which is inborn. FDR was lucky to have that optimistic temperament, which was inborn. And Johnson had unbounded energy. But in general, it was through hard work at every step along the way that he made himself. And then he had the chance. If JFK hadn't been killed, he probably never would have been elected president in his own right. But you sense with Lincoln, for example, that events m made him recognize he had to lead. Right. Yeah, I mean, Lincoln's such an interesting case. I mean, from the time he was young, he did have some desire to do something special. Even the first time he ran for office, he was 23 years old. And he writes a handbill. You had to write to tell your constituents, hopeful constituents, why you would want to be in the state legislature. And he said, even then, every man has pe his peculiar ambition. Mine is to be esteemed of by my fellow man and to be worthy of their esteem. And then he says, how far I shall achieve my ambition is yet to be determined. I have no popular relations to recommend me. I haven't lived here very long. He'd moved into the town six months before, was working in a general store. And he said, but if I fail, and I probably will. Um, he, I promise you I'll come back five or six times before it's too humiliating, and then I'll finally never run again. I mean, he had that perseverance even then, but more importantly, he had that desire for the ambition to be longer than the self. Most of the other guys go in just for the desire. It's fun, and then they become ambitious for something larger. I interviewed President Obama for an exit interview before he left office, and we were talking about Lincoln's peculiar ambition, and I said, how does, how does that apply to you? And he said, well, I would have to admit that when I was young, my ambition wasn't that exalted. I just maybe wanted to make my mark to impress my absent father or a mixed race kid to show the kids in the neighborhood I could be it. It was only later that it got attached to something larger. So that's where Lincoln is different from these other three. Well, and then what, what about Franklin Roosevelt and, and his disability? I mean, was that, was that what made him struggle and struggle for leadership? Without a question. I mean, Franklin Roosevelt, when he runs for office the first time, he's a little later than the others. The others are 23 years old when they first make their public mark. He's 28, and he's working in a Wall Street conservative law firm. He's not been a particularly good student at Harvard or Groton or Columbia Law School. He's not even that energetic, it seems, at the law firm. But then they come to him and they say, would you like to run for a safe Democratic seat in Dutchess County, where he came from? And the reason they didn't see the makings of a leader in him, but they knew his mother would support the campaign because she was wealthy, and they knew his name was Roosevelt, and Teddy Roosevelt was still long dead but so popular, they figured some Republicans who were old might think that Roosevelt Franklin was Teddy, and they'd vote for him as well as the Democrat. But the interesting thing is he said yes right away. And when he got out on the campaign trail, it was his natural environment. Even though he'd come from this really insulated background, when he started talking to people, he would ask them questions. They said he wasn't such a great speaker at first, that he would pause between sentences, and they were afraid he would never go on. And then after a while, he was talking so long, they were afraid he'd never go off. But <laughs> so he was a good, po he wins, and then he stays in, and he becomes a good politician. But then what happens is when he gets polio and is paralyzed from the waist down, it is a transformative experience, because it made him connect to other people to whom fate had dealt an unkind hand so that he could deal with the poor and the underprivileged in a much more empathetic, emotional way than he would have before. Then when he was at Warm Springs and he set up the rehabilitation clinic, it was amazing. He became, that was his real leadership. He built the whole place. All the pe fellow polio patients come. And more importantly, he shows his vulnerability in the pool with them. He's swimming with them. They're learning to exercise in the giant waters, the warm waters. But more importantly, he teaches them that you can still have fun in your life despite this terrible paralysis. So they have water polo games, they play tag, they have wheelchair dances, they have cocktail hours at night. And they said, I read the oral histories, that he made them feel that they could, they could live a life again.
So obviously when he gets to the depression and the people are paralyzed from the depression, he gives them that optimism that we'll get through this together. I've done this before and we'll do it together. It's, it was an extraordinary change, I think, in him. Each of these people, as you talk about them, and we'll come to Franklin in just a second, um, spark immediate questions about present leaders, which we'll come to in just a, a sec. But first, um, what therefore makes Franklin a leader? Well, I think the main thing that Franklin Roosevelt was able to do was to communicate with the people. He had this belief that if you tell the people what's happening and what the government is trying to do, they will generally choose the right course. And he's, he came to power at the time of the radio. And it was the perfect medium for him. It's interesting. I mean, Lincoln was there at the time when the speeches would be printed in full in the newspapers. <coughs> so that it was great that he had a gift for language because people would read them. They would read them aloud in country homes and city homes. Teddy Roosevelt comes in when the national newspapers have just come in. And all these little sayings that he has, he could be a good tweeter today. You know, speak softly and carry a big stick. Don't hit until you have to, and then hit hard. He even gave Maxwell House the slogan, good to the very last drop. But then Franklin comes along with the radio, and what he was able to do was to project an intimate voice to the people so the people felt he was talking directly to them. Um, he would start off, my friends, and then he would patiently explain policies. If you look at these fireside chats, they're not just fluffy things. They're telling you why the banks have been closed, why it's safe to put your money back in once they open again. And people then listen to him, and they do as he says, because he's persuaded them. The, the novelist Saul Bellow said you could walk down the street on a hot Chicago night and not miss a word of what he was saying. You could see everybody looking at their radio and hear his voice coming out. And you could keep walking, because eight out of 10 people would be listening to his fireside chats. And then there's a story of a construction worker coming home one night. And the partner said, where are you going? He said, well, my president, he's coming to speak to me in my living room. It's only right I be there to greet him when he comes. <laughs> so it was that tone. When he died, actually, people all around gathered and said, we've lost our friend. Incredibly, one person died, and all millions of people feel lonely. And obviously, he did it again in World War II, those great fireside chats. There's one he gives a map speech in February of 42, when America's losing in the Far East, and nothing's gone well. And he tells everybody to get a map in front of them so they can follow the, the war. They have to understand, we thought the isolation was thought because we had the oceans. We were safe. So yeah. that's why they were so against our doing anything with Europe. And then finally, he explains the whole thing. And after that, support went up. So mm. it was that ability to talk directly and simply. Whenever there was a five-letter word, he'd make it a three-letter word. If it was mm. a 10-letter word, he'd make it five letters. He talked to the shop girl and the construction <laughs> worker, and he knew how to speak to them. So finally, Teddy. Well, Teddy Roosevelt, when he first goes into politics, he admitted that it wasn't for doing something great. It was just for the adventure. He's 23 years old. He runs in the silk stocking area. And when he first gets in, he's kind of full of himself, which might remind us of some, some of our current politicians. He had, what he said, a swelled head. And he started yelling at the Democratic opponents. He would blisterly get after them and, you know, and pound his desk and say horrible things about them. And he made headlines all through New York State. But then he realized, this is the thing, the key is humility to be able to acknowledge your limitations and learn from them. He realized he wasn't getting anything done in the legislature because the Democrats were so mad at him. Even his fellow Republicans thought he was being too much of a show off. So he softened his rhetoric. And he also then began to develop more empathy. I think empathy is one of the most important qualities in a leader. I think Lincoln was born with it. And some, to some extent, um, LBJ saw it because of the poverty in which he lived. But the other two had to develop it. And he went to these tenements, Teddy did, and he saw the way people were living. He saw child labor. And he began to feel, as he said, maybe conscious at first, but then it becomes unconscious, a fellow feeling for other people. And he wanted to make their lives better. But then the big thing that happens to him, as you're suggesting, they all go through these crucibles. And he's in the state legislature. And his wife, who's only 22, is about to give birth to a child. His mother, who's only 49, comes to New York City to help take care of her while he's in Albany. He gets a telegram saying, um, your child is born. Cigars are all, all passed around. Then he gets a telegram uh, an hour later saying, you have to come home at once. Your wife is dying, and your mother is dying too. His mother had contracted typhoid fever just while in New York. And he got home in time for her to die. 12 hours later, his wife died in childbirth. And that depression that he cycled into was only abated when he went west. He leaves the east, and he goes to the Badlands for two years, actually. He becomes a cowboy. 
But as he, and he was able to outride depression or black care, he said, by just moving so fast on his horse 15 hours a day, he could finally sleep at night. But the most important thing is he became then a man, the big division in America then was the East and the West, the conservative East and the more progressive West. And the West was sort of like, not the far West, but the West. So he was able to bridge those divides. And when he became president, he was able to be president of all the people, which he never would have been. He would have been an effete Easterner if that hadn't happened. So these crucibles made a, a huge difference in these people's lives. If they can become more wise and have more perspective as a result of them, that then, then I think they can become one of these characters as a leader. Given the way the world has evolved, do you think those days are over when you could ever have principled, uh, articulate, um, you know, coherent leadership? <laughs> no, I mean, no, I know. I mean, I mean, the worrisome thing for us now in America, and I think there's an echo here, is that one of the things Teddy Roosevelt warned against was that democracy would break if people in different regions and religions and races began seeing each other as the other rather than as fellow American citizens. And that's certainly what's happened in our country. There's been a polarization for years, actually, between the people in the rural areas, between old, older people who felt like the country had passed them by. They lost their manufacturing jobs. They lost their middle class status. They felt the elites weren't paying attention to them. They felt the system of education hadn't given their kids mobility. And then the people on the coasts, for whom the financial world has been very good to them, and this huge gap has arisen between the rich and the poor. And the problem is I, that you need people going into politics whose desire is to heal those divisions. And Mr. Trump ran on exacerbating those divisions and is continuing to do so. He found that group of people who were feeling hurt by the system and made them feel as if he were on their side. And the one encouraging thing I which, would... Which in and of itself is extraordinary because um, he is actually of the cause of their misery. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and he's done nothing to help it. And, and, he, but, and, he, and he came from, from that world mm -hmm. that they were feeling and somehow celebrity and entertainment projected itself. I mean, that's the worrisome thing. And, this and loud mouth. And, and a very loud mouth, and, 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 and you know, people in the rallies make America great again, isolationism, terribly unfair tariffs, where you know, America's been taken advantage of, and immigrants are the cause. So he found a scapegoat for these people for what was their problem, which was nothing to do with immigrants. And so the, uh, he, he's got a, a, a non-diverse group of people who, but they're a core group no matter what he does. I mean, it's so many times during the campaign we think, oh, it's over when this Access Hollywood cape came and he talked about how he could do anything to any woman because of his power. We thought it was over. When he said John McCain, the senator, wasn't a hero because he didn't break out of the prison, you know, we thought that's the end. Um, in fact, there have been so many times when we thought it's the end, and yet somehow that base stays with him. But I think to your larger question, the one encouraging thing about the midterms was that my worry has been in these last years that the best people are not entering public life. And maybe that's why we have a dearth of leadership. They know, you know their private lives are going to be exposed by the media. They know they're going to have to spend huge amounts of their time raising money. And they spend like four hours out of every day, they say, raising money, which means they've got to appeal to a small group of people who often are the wealthy people. And it hasn't been fun being in politics. I mean, Congress has gotten so little done. There's been so little bipartisanship for so long. Would you want to go into politics? Instead, these same people, as we were talking about, are going into the financial world, or they're going in to, to make money. But the midterm elections were encouraging because a whole group of new people came into politics because of Trump. They've been so energized. So you had more women by far than ever, ever before, teachers and doctors, people who'd never been in public life before. And you had young people voting 500% times more than they did in the last midterm. You had the largest midterm, long-term lines. So maybe the citizens are getting awakened to the fact that they have to take some responsibility because they voted, I mean, not they, but the young didn't vote as much as they should have. A lot of Hispanics didn't vote like you would think they would have. And now they're, they're energized. So if that happens, maybe we'll see a change. But will those people, who, those new people, ascend to leadership? Where, where, where does leadership come? I mean, they've, okay, they've, they've run against the grain right. and they've achieved, but how, how, do you, how do you believe that they will go forward given that they're now doing it in the context of a social network, of an election, for example, in America, which cost $5 billion. Know. Um, you know, the, the, the hindrances are vast. 
I, I guess the hope I have is that every real change that's come place in our country has come from a movement. I mean, when Lincoln was called the liberator, he said, um, don't call me that. It was the anti-slavery movement that did it all. Um, and that's true. The anti-slavery movement arose. It took years to develop. It then creates the old re the Republican Party, and then Lincoln becomes the spokesman for that. The progressive movement in the cities and states was there long before Teddy Roosevelt and Franklin Roosevelt. It had already started settlement houses. There was a social gospel in the churches. They were trying to soften the terrible aspects of the Industrial Revolution. And of course, the Civil Rights Movement was there before Lyndon Johnson. So what we need in our country, and maybe here too, is we need a political revolution. The way we elect our presidents is no good. The congressional boundaries are drawn by partisans, gerrymandered. Um, the money in the system is absolutely the poison. Um, and and there's, you know, there's ways to change those things. I mean, there's constitutional amendments to get rid of some of them. There's changes in the congressional boundary lines. FDR said problems created by man can be solved by man. Um, so I, I guess I'm still optimistic that we've been through worse times before and we've come through them again. But it's very hard to see. It's, uh, because these guys that are coming into the Congress and these women are going to be freshmen, you know, and the leaders are the old people. And even like Nancy Pelosi, our speaker, if she wins, will she then go against these younger people that are saying they won't vote for mm -hmm. her? Or will she have the generosity to realize, I've got to include them in the system, even though they didn't vote for me? It's, it's a complicated thing, but somehow we've got to believe that democracy is not failing. Although I was saying to John, I saw an article in the paper the other day where it said that right now, people in America, a, they a parent would feel worse if their child um, joined the opposite, married somebody from the opposite party than if they were different religions or races. That's how hyper-partisanship things are in our country, and it's crazy. The divisions in all our societies in the West are very, very deep. You see it right across Europe, you see it in this country, you see it in your country. And leadership, one senses from what you've written, it does eventually come from unity, bringing right. people together in a cause. And that seems to be what's uh, evading leaders of today. Um, and you know, we think about our own country. Well, now one of the most remarkable things is you have this very, very divided society over Brexit. And you have a prime minister who is beginning to get traction for her pure endurance. Not from what she believes, because it's not evident what she does believe, because she, she voted <laughs> Remain, but has sort of worked to bring about Brexit. You know, wonderful Democrat that she must be, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I mean, th that, that's, that's what's so challenging. Yeah, I mean, clearly, you know, if she believed in Remain, you would have hoped she would have communicated that when she herself, you know, when, when, the, when the referendum was taking place. She didn't campaign at all for it. Wow. See, I mean, that, that's the difference between public leadership and internal leadership. Mm. I mean, it reminds me more just listening to maybe about Lyndon Johnson was that kind of deal maker, mm. and he would have counted votes. He would have known, even if those people resigned, he knew how many he could have so that they wouldn't have whatever that 48 is so that he could take that chance. But that's not public leadership. That's mm. sort of internal leadership. But you see, there's another reason why she survives. We have a phrase here which Mrs. Thatcher uh, conjured or was conjured about her, TNA, there is no alternative. Right. Uh, and nobody can see an alternative. The leaders in the other parties are pretty distressing too. Um, you know, so you have a unity of uh, non-leading -lead capacities. I mean, you couldn't say any of them are great leaders. Possible marginal exception in Scotland where uh, there is somebody who has um, led pretty well, although she's in some difficulty now, Ms. Sturgeon. Um, but that, that's the point. It doesn't seem that you have the seeds of a great leader who by some transforming moment will become that leader that Lincoln became. Well, I think we've certainly reached a crisis point where something has to happen. It may not be as, as stark as a depression or World War II, but there's a felt sense of enormous anxiety in our country, and I think here too. Totally I mean, people, neutral. you talk to anybody, they say, this is the worst of times. We have to get through this. And there was, I, I don't know him, but there was one person who ran for the Senate in Texas, this guy Beto O'Rourke, mm -hmm. and he somehow was able to go to every county in Texas and even though he lost, he didn't lose by a lot in a red state of Texas, mm -hmm. and he captured the imagination of the country because he kept the same message, but he realized he could say it everywhere, and he could be accepted everywhere because he was talking authentically. 
And so, the, and the guy who lost in Florida was a really interesting leader. The woman who lost in Georgia, they lost by a small amount. So I, I'm more optimistic. I guess I just have to be, you know, that somehow this is what this has taught me. I mean, I worry about these leaders today because they all just work so hard that they don't, I mean, think about Churchill. He took plenty of time to relax. <laughs> you know, so did FDR. I mean, FDR had these cocktail parties every night when he was in World War II where the rule was that you couldn't talk about the war. You could talk about books you'd read, Matt, you could talk about movies and gossip, but he knew that leaders had to find, and social media makes it really hard mm. for any of us. It's, it's like They were pretty busy, my guys, and yet they all found time to, to think and to relax. And after a while for FDR, this cocktail party mattered so much that he wanted the people who would be at the cocktail party to live in the White House to be ready for the cocktail party. <laughs> so the White House became the most exclusive residential hotel you could possibly imagine. Um, his foreign policy advisor, Harry Hopkins, lived there. He came for dinner one night early in the war, stayed over, never left until the war came to an end. <laughs> Lorena Hickok, Eleanor's friend, had a bedroom next to Eleanor. His secretary, Missy Lahan, lived there. Princess Martha from Norway in exiles there on the weekends. There's only like six bedroom suites on this second floor. And, of course, the great Winston Churchill spent weeks at a time in a room diagonally across from Roosevelt's. So when I was working on the book, I became obsessed with the thought that these people must have been in their bathrobes at night in the corridor that surrounds these bedroom suites and how I would love to have listened to their conversations. And I, I, however, when I'd been up there with LBJ, when I'd worked for him when I was 24, I never thought of asking, where was Churchill, where was <laughs> Roosevelt, where was Eleanor? So I mentioned this on a radio program in Washington, and it happened Hillary Clinton was listening then in the White House, so she invited me to sleep overnight in the White House. She said we could then wander the corridor together and figure out where everyone had slept 50 years earlier. So a couple weeks later, after a state dinner, the president, Mrs. Clinton, my husband and I, with my map in hand, went through every room and figured out, yes, Chelsea Clinton is sleeping where Harry Hopkins was, the Clintons were sleeping where FDR was, and we were in Winston Churchill's bedroom. There was no way, no way I could sleep. But I was certain he was in, the, in, the, in there drinking his brandy and smoking his cigar. The thing about Churchill was he clearly was a great leader, but he was a, a leader honed in war. Right. Uh, and actually not a very good peacetime leader. Exactly. In fact, useless. No, in fact, one of the really interesting questions that I try to deal with here is that um, it, you have to be the right person for the right time. That, for example, Buchanan, James Buchanan, was the leader before Lincoln. He had the crisis. The country was already beginning to split apart, but he made those divisions worse. In fact, he's considered on the president, he was considered on the presidential polls at the very bottom until the last poll where Mr. Trump is now at the bottom. And they, they mentioned in the newspapers that the Buchanan family relatives were celebrating. They were no longer at the bottom. I mean, Herbert Hoover was a very decent man. He was there when the Depression happened but he had no capacity to deal with the ideological change that it would necessitate that the federal government had to help out. It couldn't be state and local and volunteerism. So he goes down as one of the worst presidents. And I'm not sure that JFK could have gotten the Civil Rights Bill through the Congress the same way that LBJ mm. did. So you're absolutely right. The, it, it, the temperament has to, the opportunity has to be there to be a great leader. And often it's a crisis that creates it, but you have to have the temperament that's fit for it, or you could be a great failure. Do you have to have a great charisma? For example, if you take Churchill, after Churchill, after the war, after his great victory, he lost, and he was replaced by one of the plainest little men uh, that ever lived, uh, and he produced the welfare state, uh, the NHS, the envy of the world, um, uh, Mr. Attlee. Uh, right. And um, we could argue that he was a great leader. Right. Yeah, I don't, I, the worry about today is because of the media world and the entertainment value, certainly in our country, um, if, if we start selecting a bunch of entertainment people, there's all these sport mm. figures now that are, that's going to say, I think I can run now that this guy's run. No, charisma helps, but I, I don't think you need it always. I mean, I, I can still remember, it still stunned me to know that Churchill was, that the party was turned out. I remember hearing him say, not hearing him say, reading that he said, I'm not that old, um, <laughs> reading that he said he wished he had died like Roosevelt, that this was much harder to have to mm. endure. But then, of course, he comes back again. <laughs> and he still is drinking and everything until he's 90. I mean, he's every man's dream, I think. <laughs> you, you touched on the mechanics of politics when it, when it gets into power. Uh, and, and one of the things I, I wonder whether one of the great disabilities is actually the where politics is done in, in, in the Senate, in the Congress, in our Houses of Parliament. In our case, I think to some extent in your case too, uh, 
antediluvian practices still continue. Um, and, and the system is not geared to actually enabling great change to occur. Right. I think that's right. The sis our system was built with the checks and balances to make it really hard to get something through unless the country really is demanding it. I mean, even when Teddy Roosevelt came in and wanted to regulate industry and to begin to deal with the corruption of the railroads and to break up big companies that were swallowing up small companies, he couldn't have done that because the conservatives owned the Congress, his party, the Republican Party. But he worked on a deal with the press, and the press were doing all these investigative, muckraking journalism, and the country got all exercised about what was wrong, and then it pushed the people inside. You need the, it's always the people that have to push from the outside in. So that's why there's still hope for me that, that things are getting exercised on the people. And, and, and here too, right, there's been marches, there's, I mean, if you had only had another, what, if you had another referendum now, would it be anti-Brexit? Well, it would be close. It would be close, wow. I, I mean, it is said that it would be the other way, but uh, I think there's no evidence of a huge swing. I, I don't think I'm right in saying that. There are many more expert people here than <laughs> I am. But let, let me ask you just one, one other area. Now, before coming here, I thought, where do I encounter great leadership? And you do, you do. You, you find it in headmasters of schools, headmistresses yeah. of schools. You encounter it, therefore, in education, in, in medicine. Um, and in the financial services industry, in the finance services. I've really met some unbelievably creative, clever people, but they're simply making large quantities of money and have no interest whatever. They're very, they're very good with their money. They give it to charity and all the rest of it, but they, they don't have any interest in coming and trying to help us run our country. Um, and I'm just wondering whether the great growth in corporate life in, in our time has delivered us of a situation in which there are all that leadership is drained into this area. Now, I notice that one of the great extollers of your book is Warren Buffett. <laughs> now, he's been awfully good with his money. Could he have been a great leader? It's, it's a really good question. I mean, I do think you're right that most talented students now, I mean, we have a shrinking of liberal arts in the colleges, um, so it's either going into technology and, and, and software or it's going into the financial. I mean, business schools and, and you know, these, these are taking away the best, the best people probably because they can see a huge financial reward. And then they can tell themselves, and when I get there, I'll be able to help. But it's very mm. different to just give your money, you know, philanthropically as opposed to being willing to be a public servant. I mean, what we have to do is to make politics vol honorable again. I mean, that's, that's been the problem. I mean, like only 11% support the Congress. I mean, and, and the way the people feel about people in power, that's why Trump won in part, too. He was outside the system. I actually do think that somebody who's been a great business leader, who's had to deal with shareholders and customers and public opinion and, and build a team, a team that can continue to work, could translate. I mean, Bush, I'm not Bush, Trump actually had never really had a team. He'd never really been a big businessman. He had himself, and he branded himself. But like Mayor Bloomberg is now thinking of running for president. Um, Bob Iger, the head of Disney, I interviewed him um, some weeks ago just in a conversation. And he, for a while, had been thinking of running. Um, I, I interviewed Tim Cook. I don't normally interview these people. I just happened to interview these two at, in a conversation. Um, Tim Cook of Apple, who is a really interesting man and who's been taking a leading position on some of the social issues to the extent where sometimes the shareholders go against him. I had a funny conversation with him which had to do with the fact that I was telling him how my various leaders well, could get to sleep at night when they were anxious because they had such big decisions. And Lincoln would read a funny Shakespeare comedy so that that could be in his head as he went to sleep. FDR had this ability when he was really tired and unable to sleep that he would imagine himself a young boy at Hyde Park again, going down the hill and picking up his sled and coming up the hill, like counting sheep over and over again. So I said to him, well, what do you do? And he said, I take an Ambien. <laughs> I mean, anyway. Course, we, we would have to point to Mr. Macron, who did come out of um, you know, that kind of life and whose ratings at the moment are 18%. Yeah, I, I, I can't tell from the other side of, of the ocean what's happened to him because I, he seems to have favored those people, right? Mm. He seemed at first that he would not, mm. and he seemed like a, a really exciting young leader. Now, I know that, I mean, uh, unless, unless the, you know, the wealth of the nation 
can be shared with the majority of the people in some way that they get the benefit of their, I mean, Lincoln used to say what a democracy depends on is that you can use the system and education is critical to it to rise to the level of your discipline and your talents. Mm -hmm. If you can't do that and the system squashes that chance and allows people with certain move to funnel to the top, then, then democracy is in peril. And I think that's what's happened everywhere. It's the lack of mobility. I don't even care about the gap between the rich and the poor, but lack of mobility, which is true in our country. I mean, the kids who are the kids of all these people who are now voting for Trump, you know, the school system failed them. You know, they may not have finished high school. They've gotten into opioids. They don't feel there's a future for them. And, and that, that's a problem unless we can figure out how to solve that. But you're still an optimist. I still am, because I think that some, someone's going to, some, this is a huge crisis that we're facing. And, um, and I think there are ways to reform the political system despite the checks and balances. And I think the people are beginning to awaken. I mean, if Trump were to be reelected, to be honest, in 2020, then I, my optimism would fail. Because <laughs> um, so I, I, but I don't see that happening. I mean, when I look at the well, quality, shouldn't he have flopped much worse than he did this time? Definitely, around? definitely. I mean, well, the house, this, this, the structure was such that it was really hard to win those Senate seats because all the Democrats were up. It just, it was. We were hoping it was a structural thing, but he really lost pretty big in the house. He won't acknowledge it. I mean, one of the problems for him is that if you argue, which I would, that going through losses is something that strengthens you, he, will, he hasn't accepted that he's ever lost. He said he had the very, very best temperament of anyone who'd ever run for president because he always won. And, and he hasn't acknowledged that he, he lost. He was bankrupt four times. And he was bankrupt. His brother died. He's been through all sorts. But he, doesn't, he can't, thinks it's a weakness to think about that. And as a result, when he's been asked now, well, you were at the famous press conference. He was there. I mean, I was just watching this where he's explaining. He was the, very orange. Oh, he was <laughs> more than usual, right? More, more than usual. More than usual. But, yeah. you know, he's asked about, you know, the midterms that he lost them. And what does he say? Everyone that I supported, I won. And then the people who lost were because they didn't ask me to, to come for them. So they lost. They're losers. And then he mentions their names. I mean, it just it's hurts enough to lose. You know, and, and so he said, so I won and, and they lost. And then he said, should I be happy or sad? Like he should be happy because the Republicans lost who didn't mm. ask him? Um, it's just, I mean, he doesn't, the, the qualities that these people have, humility, acknowledging errors, empathy, um, ability to control emotions, <laughs> to, I mean, Lincoln was great. He had a hot letter he wrote when he was mad at people, and he would put the letter aside, hoping he'd cool down psychologically and never send it. Um, and though, when he opened his papers in the 20th century, you see all these blistering letters to people, but never sent and never signed. Of course, when Trump gets angry in the middle of the night, it's right out there in, in a tweet. Um, so that any of those qualities that you look for in, in a leader, forget that he's president. Um, mm. They're not there. Well, uh, last question before we go to the audience. Um, uh, I was based in Washington from 82 to 87, Reagan. And when Reagan came in, we, we all sort of thought, you know, well, come on, he's a B star, B movie star, all the rest of it. He delivered. I mean, Absolutely. was he a great leader or was he just jolly lucky to have awfully good people around him? Well, he chose the awfully good people around him. So, no, I, I must say, I may not have agreed ideologically with Reagan, but he not only created a, an aura of strength and optimism, and the economy then began to pick up, and the way he dealt with the Soviet Union seemed to be coming from a matter of strength, um, but he created a generation of conservatives behind him. So that's a huge leadership capacity. Mm -hmm. I mean, Obama did not create, he, he, he became into the presidency with this extraordinary communication. Um, I have gotten to know him very well. He's, I mean, in contrast, he just seems like an extraordinary leader, obviously. There's a stability and a decency and, 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 and a truth about him. Um, but the generation that came after him didn't come out in those elections. Mm. And the young people now have to be fired up again. But Reagan did that. And no, I think Reagan, one of the most important things is to create a team of people who are stronger. Perhaps they know more than you do. And you listen to them and you learn how to deal with them. You give them a sense of common mission. He did that. No, <laughs> I, I look back now at Reagan and, and would, I mean, I'm not sure he belongs with these no. guys. But he certainly is raising again in the presidential historian's polls. Mm. I keep mentioning them. We, like, we don't really know things half the time either. But. <laughs> Well, Doris, that's really fantastic. Let's uh, open it up to the floor. I mean, anybody wants to ask a question? Well, I saw your hand first. Given your sense of optimism, do you think assault rifles will ever be banned 
um, in the next 10, 15 years, and why does Congress not do something? Is it the NRA with their money, but then you look at Michael Bloomberg and his money? Why do you think common sense doesn't prevail with regard to assault rifles? Well, the encouraging thing that I just saw was that in this last election, more money was contributed to the anti-gun people than the gun people for the first time. Um, now, whether that will make a difference, you know, we keep thinking it's just the NRA's money and they are threatening that anybody who goes against them, they can run a candidate against them and they can lose the election. But the numbers of sufferings that have happened in these last years, um, the Parkland, Florida kids who then went on a tour and talked about voting and getting people registered and were so courageous. And, and then you, you see it again. We've seen a couple of them this last year. It's got to make an impression on people that there's no reason in the world that somebody who wants to be a sport hunterman or wants to defend the Second Amendment the way the founders did has to have an assault rifle. I mean, it, may, it is totally crazy. And I just have a feeling uh, that opinion's moving slowly, but it's going to take money and it's going to take candidates who deliberately are willing to say that they're, this is one of the things they're going to vote for. Again, it's going to be the people pushing the Congress because there's too many of those people still there who will never, never be willing to vote for it. Yes, sir. Thank you. <coughs> Over the doorway of, um, of Colleague Harlech in West Wales is written in Welsh, Bead Ben, Bead Bont. He who is to be a leader must be a bridge. John and you both referred to the deep divisions within societies here, Europe and in your own, your own country. How does a leader reach out to those with differing views and sometimes quite vicious differing views without demonstrating to that leader's own supporters that this is a sign of weakness and compromise. Personally, I think compromise is a strength, but it's often looked upon as a weakness. So what are the qualities needed to be able to bridge that divide? That's a wonderful question. I mean, I think, first of all, that when you're looking for bridging the divide and finding consensus, I think it is important that you put out what it is you believe in so that, but then you can compromise in order to get much of that through. I mean, um, Lyndon Johnson, for example, there was a huge racial divide when he came into the presidency, but he reached out to, I mean, he knew what he wanted. He wanted that civil rights bill through, but in all of his talks, he would talk about the South in a positive way. He would say, things will be better for the South if the civil rights bill passes. This is not a northern problem. It's not a southern problem. He would talk about the fact that the North um, hadn't done a great deal with, with integration of blacks either, so he didn't make the people feel guilty in the South, as did Lincoln. You know, I mean, what, what he was doing is he never stopped for the Emancipation Proclamation, but he would talk about the fact that when this war was coming to an end, he wanted the South reintegrated into the Union. And so that's his famous second inaugural speech, that the sin of slavery was shared by both sides. Both read the same Bible, both prayed to the same God, neither's prayers were fully answered. And then with malice toward none and charity for all, let us bind up the nation's wounds. So I think what you need is a leader. First of all, they just have to go to the other parts of the country and they have to talk to the people. Um, one of the things Teddy Roosevelt did when he got in was he took a train trip, a whistle stop train tour around the country for six weeks in the spring and every, every fall. And he would go to the people who, who didn't vote for him, and he would absorb their understanding so that it could become part of his language. So I think the most important thing is right now, they just go to where they've been elected, mm -hmm. and they, they talk to those people, and they get the money from those people. And so then they harbor the same feelings about the other side. And if they're ever going to persuade people they're going to be a bridge, they have to really understand what the other side is feeling and thinking. And I think that's, that's why this O'Rourke guy in Texas, I think, made such traction, because he went to all those places where they, don't, they didn't want him. And, and he listened to them, and then he could absorb their language without changing what he was going for. But you're right about compromise. I mean, somebody said that James Madison was asked in the Constitution, what are the three principles of this new Constitution? And he said, well, the first is compromise. Then he paused. Second is compromise. The third is compromise. I mean, but you have to not compromise principles as much as ideas that can make things come together. So that's, that's a really important question. I've worked out how the RSA works. Three men, have, five, three men have caught my eye, you know, before I've asked for questions. And I've got them in my list. But are there any women who'd like to ask? Yes, yeah. indeed, ma'am. Yeah. <laughs> where, where are you, voice? Voice. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Hi, I'm just interested in sort of encouraging different leaders from different sectors to come into 
public life, do you think the level of scrutiny our leaders are under is putting people off from coming in? And how can we tackle that? Because we need different thinking to come into politics. I think it is a real problem. I mean, I think in the old days, you know, like in Franklin Roosevelt's time, it used to be said that their private lives were relevant only if their private lives affected their public responsibilities. And I still think that should be true. I mean, if there's hypocrisy and somebody's out there saying something, you know, whatever, about abortion and then, you know, has, some, has his wife have an abortion or something because he made, then that's a different thing. But mostly what's happening in your family, um, it, it's a really difficult thing to know that you're putting yourself forward and that whatever mistakes you may have made in the past are going to be there in the public. So you have to just trust that public service still is such an extraordinary thing to do. I mean, if somebody has a long public service career, I think it's one of the most rewarding things possible, at least it was in the old days before you couldn't get anything done. You know, you're seeing other people, you're talking to them, you're expanding your understanding of things, you're possibly changing their lives. And, and I think something's happened ever since, it's like the like eight, 1980s for us when Gary Hart was having an affair and it became front page news. That's the first time anybody was ever asked, are you having an affair? That changed things. I mean, Franklin Roosevelt, you know, at the time was seeing his old friend Lucy Mercer. Thank God it didn't become public. We would have lost Franklin Roosevelt as, <laughs> our, as our leader in World War II. Um, and obviously the people didn't even know then that he had un the un inability to actually walk on his own power. There was an honor code among the press to never show him with his braces on or in his wheelchair. When he gave his 1936 acceptance speech, he was coming down the aisle, leaning on two arms, and he fell and his speech sprawled in front of him and his braces unlocked, it was a mess. They had to get him up, they get him up at the podium and he delivers his speech, the great rendezvous with destiny speech. There's never a picture of him on the floor, never a mention that he'd fallen. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Pre President Ford falls down the plane steps and we watch it a hundred times. President Bush is sick in Japan and we watch him being sick in Japan. I mean, the press is, 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 is part of the problem and it's also part of the solution right now. I mean, the, this is the worst thing that's happening in our country right now is the enemy of the people, as pres President Trump is calling the press. But I think after the Clinton impeachment, I think there was a shift to the part of the press to some extent. I mean, now affairs are not undoing Mr. Trump. Um, and, that, and that may be one of the good things that's come out of this, only in the sense that we can't keep letting these people not be eligible for public life. It used to be you couldn't have a divorce and you couldn't be in public life. So now there's a greater tolerance for all these things, and maybe more people will be willing to take that risk um, knowing that. Well, the only thing I'm grateful to Gary Hart for is he took his campaign plane right down, right into the uh, Grand Canyon, and it was the most wonderful view you could see. Oh. <laughs> and, um, and now who, who, who oh. knew Hollywood would make a film of that? <laughs> anyway, you, you, yes. So I think we have an image of American society having a strong sense of mutual social obligation, of moral proximity, town by town, village by village. And I wonder how far you feel that has changed as well and driven some of the divisions. And that we may have a myth of the great society uh, where people's responsibility towards another, each other is very strong. Has that changed or is it re will it re-emerge? Has that driven some of what's happening? Yeah, you know, in a, in a good way, I think, if you look at what's happening in, in, in towns and cities and even in some states, there's still problem solving across the party lines. A friend of mine, Jim Fallows, has just written a book called Our Towns. He and his wife went around the country for the last couple of years and went to a bunch of towns. And you could see there some of the less hyper-partisanship because a mayor has to deal with problems. You know, are you going to get the snow off the street? Are you going to get the garbage clean? And somehow it's not as partisan. I'm not sure if this is directly answering your question, but I, I think this is a positive thing that maybe we look to those areas now, and maybe that's where the leaders are going to come from rather than from Washington. The people in Washington have just been poisoned so long. It's not like they've been in war so long. They don't know what peace is like, and they don't know how to deal with one another. Um, but people in the local areas do, and maybe there'll be, like, the, again, the optimism comes. In 1858, we had midterms, just as we just did now. And there's this guy who'd been in debates with Stephen Douglas and had shown himself well. He had hardly been known on the national scene before then. And suddenly he becomes the dark horse candidate for the presidency, and that's Abraham Lincoln. So I guess to, to the optimism I still hold is I've got to believe that 
they're out there. I mean, one of the people who just ran for office and won in Connecticut had been Teacher of the Year. Mm -hmm. um, so there are, there are hospital administrators that are great leaders. There are university presidents. We just have to persuade them, and that goes back to this question of what do you have to give up if you go into public life? So sometimes it's money, and sometimes it's your reputation, and, and yet it's so necessary now that in the 19th century, almost all the people who were upward climbing wanted to go into public life. It was the way you could make your mark on the world. And the more people go in, maybe the others will have more courage to do it instead mm -hmm. of just feeling like it's an individual sacrifice. Uh, you, you were an early hand, and you're a woman, which is good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, I want to mention uh, your article in Harvard Business Review, which was um, showcasing, I guess, your analysis of Lincoln. And, and the way you do it there, and I guess it's part of the book as well, um, you show how different strengths of his character come to the fore as he um, um, deals with the, the crisis from the moment when he decides he, go, he needs to go for the proclamation for the abolition of slavery to sharing that with the cabinet, to making it public, to um, uh, dealing with the, the aftermath. So in all of that process, his strengths come to the fore and he's shown as a leader who has the ability to answer to circumstances. Uh, and he has, so he has the spontaneity, the ability to use language, but he also draws on some very long established um, I love this. This is a good summary of what I wrote. <laughs> so I want to say what is so striking in the comparison between Lincoln and um, Lincoln and Trump is that Trump doesn't have any of that. He he seems to have a stock of set answers, and we pretty much um, can say how he's going to respond. Do you think perhaps the better way to uh, deal with him is to just exhibit a lot of boredom? <laughs> yes, you know, sometimes I think if we cut off the oxygen and didn't have his tweets on the air, mm. that he would just shrivel. That would mm. be the end of him. But I think, you know, what you're pointing out, though, the most important thing that Lincoln did right at the beginning was to know that he had not a lot of experience. He'd been in the state legislature four times, and he'd been a single-term congressman, and he knew that he had to surround himself. The night he won the election, he knew, I have to surround himself with people who are stronger than me. So he put into that cabinet his three chief rivals, famously, mm -hmm. um, Sewards, Chase, and Bates, each one of whom was better educated, more mm -hmm. celebrated, um, much, each one of whom thought he should have been president instead of Lincoln. But Lincoln had the confidence that he was asked, why are you doing this? You're going to look like a figurehead. This was critical to anything else he got done, to have them there. And he said, um, the country's in peril. These are the strongest and most able men in the country. I need them by my side. So having that cabinet there allowed him to have all the factions within his inner circle, the moderate, the conservative, and the, and the radical. So when he went for the Emancipation Proclamation, he knew what each one of those factions thought, because he was with these people day after day. He knew how to anticipate their viewpoints and how to persuade them to come with him as a common team, which they did, even though some didn't disagree with him. By the time he announced the Emancipation Proclamation, none of them spoke in public. But perhaps Lyndon Johnson might have put that same noble concept of having your rivals inside in a different way. He used to say, it's better to have your enemies inside the tent pissing out than outside the tent pissing in. <laughs> it's a very difficult audience, because now lots of people catch my eye, but I haven't even asked whether they want to ask a question. So uh, who wishes to ask a question? Let me, let me cast around. All men. Every single one's a man. However, I'll, I'll take you in the corner, sir. Even though you're a man. Even though you're a man. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> we've had, over, had um, 200, over 200 years of American presidents, and I'm very interested to note that the four who you have talked about and you clearly admire, all four within a period of almost exactly 100 years. You've sort of explained why, since LBJ, there haven't been great leaders except perhaps Reagan, and no doubt that's what the aftermath of Vietnam and Watergate. But why nobody before um, Lincoln? Yeah, there was a long period um, before Lincoln where um, he worried, actually, that the, what was happening in the 1830s and 1840s, there was some really poor leadership. And he worried that there was anxiety in the country and there was mob-like violence happening, that there was 
um, anti-slavery editors were being killed and lynchings were happening. And he thought that leadership was not arising. Very interesting that you should ask that question during those decades. And he feared that part of it was that the memory of the revolution, which had guided those first founding fathers, you know, from Washington up through, you know, Adams and, and Madison and Monroe, and then eventually Jackson changes it a little bit. But between Jackson and Lincoln, there's no strong leader. And he felt that as the scenes of the revolution faded and the people who'd been in it were no longer there, that cohesiveness of the country was splitting apart. And that, so his answer was, you just have to keep reading, this, I loved his answer, of course, hmm. you have to keep reading history. You have to keep remembering these moments and what the ideals of the country were. And mothers should be t telling their children the ideals of the country as they would read the Bible to them every night. Um, because he worried that in that time of anxiety, if there's not that kind of leadership, a leader will arise who is wanting to pull down rather than build up an authoritarian leader like a Caesar or a Napoleon. And this was the way to, to, to protect that, was to make sure those ideals were continually educated in the young people. I mean, in a, in a certain way, we don't have civic education anymore in our country. Um, there's not those common songs that we used to sing. There's not <coughs> a sense, we have such diverse pe people now in the country and there's a feeling that some people aren't learning the language and that they're living away and that we haven't got a common identity. What is our identity as Americans? And again, that's what Trump has been playing on, this nationalist identity, which is different from a patriotic identity. But I think it, it, it is a question, and maybe it's partly luck. I don't know the answer to it as to why leaders rise and there's big periods of time when they don't. Um, and maybe in that period there were problems between you know, the 1820s and the 1830s and the 1850s, and in fact, the country was already split by slavery and things were badly were happening, but it didn't really come to that burning point until the 1850s. But if there'd been a leader there beforehand, maybe it could have been solved earlier. Um, and I don't know, Schles Arthur Schlesinger said that he had it in every 30 years. In every 30 years, a generation arrives that cares about public life, and then they go back to private life, and then 30 years later, the next generation comes and they're in public life. So it's been a longer span now than it was before. Well, Doris, you've done us many favors today, one by appearing at all, uh, two, obviously, hugely, by writing this book, but three, I think, by giving us hope that actually if we talk about leadership and begin to really sort of, you know, go back to the whole question of civics and the rest of it, there is a chance we'll begin to kindle a, an idea in people's head that maybe they should do something. You know, all these, you know, not enough aspiration um, and... I think you've done a very great deed for democracy. Thank you very much. Oh, for you're very. Well, thank you.